the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators at the lab and I am uh, excited to welcome Carrie Riley, a friend and former co-worker. Carrie used to teach at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab and uh, Carrie is going to chat with us this morning about ghost crabs, about a little bit about their biology and their ecology and maybe she'll have a few tips for us on um, good ways to, to catch ghost crabs if you're on the beach and you want to go out ghost crab hunting at night. So with that I'm going to let Carrie talk a little bit about ghost crabs. Awesome, good morning! Super excited to be here. So ghost crabs are actually what I studied when I was getting my master's degree. I'm going to let Mendel hold on to it while I talk about it. And this one is not alive. We caught it and honestly froze it, but it's much easier to show you anatomy when they are not fighting you. So ghost crabs are decapod crustaceans, right? Crustaceans meaning they have a hard outer shell on their body and they have 10 appendages, decapod, 10 appendages. Four of these appendages are legs, which help them run, and then the front two, four on each side, so eight, and then the front two are claws. Now, if you look at the claws of a ghost crab, you can see they're actually different sizes. Now, if you're familiar with the fiddler crabs we have in the marsh, you'll know that fiddler crabs are sexually dimorphic, meaning that the males and the females look different. Male fiddler crabs have a big, big claw and a little claw, and female fiddler crabs have two little claws. Well, in the case of the ghost crabs, that's not the case. All of our ghost crabs, male or female, will have one dominant claw and one non-dominant claw. They are sexually dimorphic in that the males are bigger in general than the females. Now, our ghost crabs are semi-terrestrial, meaning that they come up on land. You guys know you've seen them running down the beach and doing all the things. Um, but they have to go back to the water to wet their gills to breathe. So they can't venture too far inland. They're not truly terrestrial crabs. They're semi-terrestrial. What they have to do is either go down straight into the water on the Gulf side or on the beach side, or they actually dig burrows. And you can see right here, this is a really great example because you can see it very clearly right here. Here's a ghost crab burrow. They'll burrow down these um, they'll burrow down in the sand and they'll burrow down deep enough that they get to damp sand. Anyone who's ever dug a hole at the beach knows if you dig deep enough, you're going to hit water or at least you're going to hit moisture down below. They are specially adapted to be able to actually hold oxygen against their gills. They have pockets that'll hold the oxygen so they can go for quite a long time. The older the crab, the longer they can survive without going down to the water but they'll dig those burrows down so that they actually don't have to retreat all the way to the front. They can go down and wet those gills just in their own burrow without ever having to leave. Another interesting thing about our crabs is their lifespan is typically about three years. They will hibernate over winter and they can last about six weeks in a state of hibernation before they have to actively wet those gills again, which is interesting. Now, our ghost crabs, when you look at them in the sand, this one you can see the modeling right, the changing of colors on the outside, they can actually slightly change the shading of their shells. And if you have one that's alive, which we do, down in the bucket, they can actually change the dark or light appearance to help them camouflage in the sand. Now, this living one's a great way to see those eyeballs. Let's see if she'll get a little feisty for me. Oh, did you see a move? They can duck them in. They have pockets on each side of their head right here where they can protect those eyes because those eyes are one of the most valuable anatomy features. They can see in 360 degrees all the way around their body to help protect them from predators. But if you're trying to catch one, a great tip is they cannot see straight up. <laughs> so they can only see around them, but they can't see straight up, which is why if you're trying to catch one, don't chase after it, drop something on top of it. You can throw a towel on it, is actually the most effective way to catch one, or just pounce it like a kitty cat. It's a great way to catch one too. Now they also use little appendages that are next to their mouths to help wipe the sand off of their eyeballs because as you can imagine, if you live on this sandy beach, they get a lot of dry sand stuck to their body and they can actually wipe the sand off. There we go, get you in this. There, the the eyeballs thing. are covered by their exoskeleton, so they're not, like wet like our eyeballs are. Oh yes, 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 excellent. They're not wet like our eyeballs, but the sand will stick to them because if they go down, just like the sand sticks to you if you go down in the water, the sand will stick to them and they'll need to wipe it off. Now you can see she's actually actively, whoo, moving that water past her gills, all right, while she's in the water, but she can come up and dry out. 
They also have, if you look really closely at those legs, I'm not sure if you can see it well on here, if you look really closely, they've got lots of little tiny hair-like structures on their legs that helps them grip the sand as well. So you can see on here the hair sticking off, that helps them grip the sand. Now, when we talk about them running, their primary running legs are these three middle ones, right? They call them six running legs because they're very muscular. And often if you see them running down the beach, these back ones will be up almost like a, a counterweight to the front claws so they can haul tail down the beach. A ghost crab can go 10 miles an hour at top speeds as it's running down the beach. They are fast little critters. Now, if, you, if they can't outrun you, they will try to, you can see she's trying to do it right here. They will actually try to bury themselves down in the sand. This one's not quite deep enough for her to do it. They will bury themselves down in the sand. They'll just hunker down and sort of shake back and forth and cover themselves up with sand and just their eyeballs will stick out. Now, these are crustaceans and like our blue crab friends and I mean all of our crab friends, they spend part of their lifetime as plankton out in the open water. So females, an interesting adaptation of the females to being terrestrial, they can become fertilized, if you will, by milk crabs at any point after they reach sexual maturity. So they don't have to wait to be soft shell for a male to be able to fertilize them. They can do it at any point. Now we know this is a female because if you look on the underside of her belly, it's this wide plate that looks kind of like half a moon that folds open and will actually hold her eggs against her body. And they will typically hunker down in their burrows until those eggs reach maturity, at which point the female will exit out into the water, essentially turn upside down in the water, shake her tushy really fast, release those eggs out into the water where they spend the first part of their lives. Now, as they mature, because they're crustaceans, these shells don't grow with them. They do have to shed this exoskeleton cover and then grow a new one as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So as they go through the different stages of, I can show you a little one. As they go through the different stages, every time they grow, they have to shed this exoskeleton and grow a new one. This is about, you can see the size difference. So this is, this is actually not as small as they get. When they first come out of the ocean, when they first go from being floating plankton out in the open water and they shift onto shore looking like a ghost crab, they are tiny, 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 tiny. And I was trying to find something that would be about the right size. This is probably about the right size. When they first come out, out of the water, they are very, this is not one, obviously, it's a rock. <laughs> I'm not sure how clear it is. But when they first come out of the water, they're absolutely tiny. And if you're sitting here, it may look just like a little fluff of sand or a little piece of feather or something running down the beach. But if you look closely, it's actually a teeny, teeny, tiny ghost crab. And then they molt and molt and molt is what, it call, is what it's called when they shed that outer skeleton as they get larger and larger and larger. Now an adult ghost crab can be as big as two plus inches across from here to here. So their entire body can be easily the size of a softball. But on this part, their main body part right here, about two inches as an adult that's grown. So yeah, what you got? So you were uh, showing some of the different, they have different um, like tactics for maintaining their burrows. Can we show a couple of those sure, different? Of course. They're not, they don't all do it the same way. No, they don't. They don't all do it the same way. When I was doing my research uh, for my degree, I happened, to, I started noticing that the crabs would dig out their burrows with different methods. And there's actually several different methods that they do. And there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. It's, it doesn't really have to do with the type of sand or the location. It, it honestly seems to be just how each crab does the individual preference. So you can see here when the sand is wet, sometimes they'll actually ball. This is a great big ghost crab burrow. It goes down this way. And you can see sometimes they'll actually ball the sand and they'll roll it up to the outside. Sometimes they will, this is a baby ghost crab right here. They made tiny little balls over here, but then they also just walk to the top. They're really fun to watch because they'll walk to the top and you can just see them hurl the sand out as much as you can. Now there are some ghost crabs. Well, another thing oh. to notice here is that some of the sand is dry. Yes. So this maybe came from closer to the surface and yep. then this sand is damp. So that's where they got down to the bottom. Actually a really interesting note about their burrows. They will dig down straight, so or sideways. They'll dig down sideways in and then at the bottom of their burrow, they'll actually create a turnaround 
and oftentimes it will go down and then come back up. So they have a low spot where they can get their gills wet in the bottom of their burrow, and then they can come back up so they're not just sitting in the water. Ghost crabs do not like to hang out in the water. They'll go down to get their gills wet, they'll go down into the water to avoid predators, but they do not hang out there. They just need to get their gills wet. If you come Let's make a quick note, this is slightly off topic, but I bet oh, no, people fine. will be curious about the dark sand and the light sand. So let's just kind of comment on this dark sand. Um, there, most of our sand on our beaches is the white um, quartz sand, but we do get some other minerals. We do have some other mineral composition to our sand, and that's what we're seeing right here. And I don't know if it's reflected on the video, but um, you can see a lot of sparkle to this sand. Sometimes we'll get uh, organic matter that washes up and it's on the beach and it can look dark on the beach. This is actually um, sand rather than like decaying organic matter. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with this sand. This isn't a this isn't a bad thing. This is this is natural. And it <laughs> it just it ju it just coincidentally it makes these burrows really uh, easy to see the ones that are in the dark sand. Yeah, it does. Did you? Oh, down here, yeah. Um, if we come a little bit further down, so you're gonna, <laughs> if you're watching this, you're probably gonna look at ghost crab burrows a lot differently now that you're walking down the beach. If you look right here, so you can tell this fresh pile of sand, we know that a ghost crab was here, but I don't see a hole. Where is it, Mendel? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, if you look, when it's really hot, this is particularly true during the, the warmest months of the summer, when it's really hot, the ghost crabs will actually come in and it's right there. So they will come in, build their burrows and then take one little, little leg and they will pull the sand back over the burrow to help keep it from heating up too much during the summer or during the, the warmest part of the day. There's and also, so, this black sand is hotter. Hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this black sand it's is hot. distinctly hotter than the white mm -hmm. sand. The other thing that ghost crabs will do Especially, especially the bigger ghost crabs, because they put a lot of time and effort into their burrows. The little ghost crabs, they have to be closer to the water. They have to get their gills wet more often. The big ghost crabs will move further away oftentimes. But you can see, you can actually see two burrows here. And this is one ghost crab hole. But what they've done is there's a vent slash escape hole right here out of the back of the burrow. So this ghost crab has cleaned it out. They're down low, but they also have this one to just sort of help airflow through to keep it nice and cool, but also to escape in case a predator comes at them from one hole or the other. So really interesting. They don't all do that, but sometimes you can see, you can see the escape holes too. What time of day, if you were to try to catch ghost crabs, what time of day would you have the most success? The most success would be at nighttime. Our ghost crabs are nocturnal. That's where they get their name. They sort of disappear. They run. They almost look spooky with those eyes as they run through. Honestly, I think the easiest time is at dusk or dawn because they are at dusk. They're just starting to come out, but it's not completely dark outside. So you can see them <laughs> as they're moving around. Um, you can spotlight them with a flashlight if it is really dark outside and that will kind of freak them out a little bit. And sometimes they'll, they'll stop perfect opportunity to throw a towel over the top of them. I'm telling you, it's the most effective ghost crab catching method <laughs> are towels or first thing in the morning. So once they're done, because they're nocturnal, they go out, they scavenge the beach, they're scavengers, so they eat whatever they can find. Um, they'll eat plant matter, they'll eat insects, they'll eat dead fish, organic material that washes up. Um, but then in the mornings is when they're sort of doing their housekeeping. So they're cleaning out their burrows. It's an excellent time to sit if you just like to watch nature do its thing. It's an excellent time to sort of sit and just watch them tidy <laughs> and clean their burrows. Um, and then during the day is not a good time because it's hot. They need to stay moist. So you can imagine all this hot sun beating down dries them out really quickly. You can see the younger ones out during the day because they do, like I said, still have to go to the water to get moisture on their gills. The older ones you really don't see during the day very much at all. Um, one thing of note, because I said that they're scavengers, an interesting side note to the research that I did was I had noticed in doing my research that ghost crabs were digging burrows. They'll tend to dig burrows close to a food source. So a lot of times if a dead fish or something has washed up on the shoreline, they'll just go ahead and dig down right there. That's all you can eat buffet. Why not have your house close by? Um, but I also noticed that they were creating burrows next to dog poo. Um, 
not everyone is mindful when they go out to the beach and clean up after their animals. And I actually did a side study and found that the ghost crabs consume and prefer, seem to actually choose the dog poo over other food sources. And so this may seem like, oh, why don't we just leave our poo out for the, for the ghost crabs to eat? Please don't, because it introduces um, when animals are on certain types of medications, not all the medications get used by their body and they will be flushed out in their excrement. And then those medications can get introduced into the shoreline ecosystem through the crabs consuming the animal poo. Um, but that was just an interesting note. They will literally eat whatever they can find. So it's kind of like the beach cleanup crew for organic matter that's yeah, washing up exactly. on the beach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they actually, they're really, they're a great example. You know you have a healthy beach if you have a healthy beach crab population. Um, one of the things that I studied was looking at the effects of beach nourishment. I know y'all had some beach nourishment in front of the lab and a lot of beaches have that just because of erosion and trying to protect the properties. Um, but I looked at the number of ghost crabs before and after the beach nourishment. And what we found was when you bring in artificial sand, um, a couple different things happened. The ghost crabs are not Wait, let's oh, let's okay. go back and say it's not artificial sand. It's just it's not, sorry, yeah. It's sorry. an artificial, like it's not part of the natural movement of sand in that system. It's yes. brought from somewhere else. Sorry, I, just, I not artificial sand. My bad. <laughs> um, it's just yeah. So bringing in sand from somewhere else to re-nourish the beach to make the beach wider for more protection of the beach properties. So what we found was when you do that, the the adult crabs are not intimidated by the equipment, so they don't run away. They oftentimes actually get entombed. So when they spread the sand out over where they've been digging their burrows, oftentimes they get buried so deeply that they, they cannot escape. So that's one thing that's happening to the adults. But the other part of the puzzle is there's a natural recruitment of, if you think of all those little baby crabs coming in off the ocean and starting to dig holes, they need, they need really nice, loose, pliable sand. And oftentimes when you have Renourishment, the sands, it's not quite as loose. It's because they've got construction equipment on there. There's a lot of different things happening. Um, and it's not as easy for our ghost crabs to start burrowing or start re-inhabiting the beach after the renourishment happens. And so what my research- So it's not necessarily showed, the, uh, the nature of the sand itself. It could be sand that is very similar in composition but it's the like compaction it's so, from the it, potentially, and the... Potentially. Okay. That's one of our theories about why. It just, it, we didn't, what we saw was you just don't have the same recruitment. You just don't have the same number of, of babies essentially choosing that or coming onto shore able to use that as their habitat. Do you know how long it takes for the recruitment to begin again on a re -nourish I beach? do not, because mine was short-term effects. <laughs> Um, but if the natural life cycle is about three years, if you have healthy populations elsewhere, as things start to settle out, because with the re beach, you're still going to have natural sand movement starting to fill in and move, and you're going to have natural changes in the beach. Um, so I would, I would assume, this is my guess, not scientific here, this is my guess, at some point in a couple years following, you'll start to have the recruitment again. How often do they build new births? So, you know, spiders make new webs. Mm -hmm like on a certain period mm -hmm. and you mentioned that they will build burrows right next to a carcass mm -hmm. or a or dog poo um <laughs> but you know that carcass is not going to stay there forever mm -hmm. so they you know may lose the the motivation to be in that particular spot well how often would they dig new burrows in different locations it well it depends on the crops some of them will continue to return until there's a reason not to so heavily areas with heavy foot traffic they're going to be building burrows frequently because their burrows are going to get destroyed and squished this particular stretch of beach we're on the sound side we're on the back we don't have very heavy foot traffic back here and if our tides don't come in super high um, they may stay in a burrow for weeks or if it's little here's the thing because as they grow they need a bigger burrow if it's little these these burrows are going to start to move further back into the dunes as they grow and get bigger so it just, there's no Why particular. Would they, yeah, so I've observed that, but um, I understand that the bigger ones can more, more easily than the smaller ones um, survive and thrive farther, farther from the water, mm -hmm. but why would they? Why, what's the, 
what's the motivation? reason? Yeah. Well, for if you think about from the standpoint of heat, the the natural if it's a natural dune system, you do have some heat relief from the plants. If if you have a natural healthy dune system, you do have some heat relief from the shade of the plants. But also, honestly, protection and just in general, more area, and they are territorial. <laughs> They don't want to be super, contrary to all the things here, they don't want to be super close to other crabs typically, and they will fight over specific territories. So, so if you look back here, there's yeah. some vegetation, some dune vegetation. Um, so that would provide a little bit of shade. Shade relief. And maybe a little bit of um, cover, maybe from predators. Mm -hmm. What kinds of animals eat ghost crabs? Raccoons, birds, a lot of different shorebirds. Um, other ghost, other crabs <laughs> will eat ghost crabs. When by other crabs, do you mean other ghost crabs? Yeah, they will eat. They will eat each other. They typically fight, but they will eat each other um, on occasion. But especially the baby ones, like the little ones who are down close to the shoreline and things. Shorebirds. That's a that's a delectable snack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like our blue crabs are delectable snacks. Um. So. For those folks who are trying to catch the crabs, mm -hmm. what, what do you suggest they do with them if they catch one? So, our crabs about all the way back here. These crabs are not, these are not like land hermit crab. <laughs> this is not something you're gonna wanna keep, keep try to catch and keep. Um, they need, they need pretty specific, ooh, I can see him bur burrowing down right now in the sand. Wiggling Whoa. down into the sand. It just disappeared. So can you see it? Do you know where it is? You can just barely see it right here. Just buried itself. So this guy, girl, not sure, is going to try to pinch me. So you wanna be sure, they can drop their limbs. So you wanna be sure you have a solid, oh, this is a boy. A solid hold on the back so leg, so you can compare. see. Yeah, so you can see the boy is long and skinny up the center of the underside, and a female is rounded. That's because the female needs that structure to hold onto her eggs. Um, you want to be sure to hold on to more than just a single leg because they will drop their legs as a as a way to protect themselves, um, and they'll regrow it next time they molt or shed that exoskeleton. They can actually regrow that appendage. You can see she's sort of, or he's bubbling right now. I keep saying she is bubbling. Um, so if you catch them, I mean, they're, they're really fun, but it's not something that you want to just put in a bucket of sand at the beach house to watch and keep for a while. They, they need the moisture. So if you decide you want to, if you have a young budding zoologist on your hands and <laughs> you want to do some observation of the crabs, be sure you have not fresh water, salt water in, in a bucket with the sand so that they can, so that they can get some moisture. And maybe keep and it to just a, an just, hour or yeah, so not and a long then time. release it. Because if you think about how hot this water is going to get out here in the, sun, in the sunshine, um, you, you, just, you don't want to keep it for a super long time. You want to let them go. These are not pets. <laughs> These do not make good pets. <laughs> um, so that's just something to keep in mind. But the best way to hold them is to pinch on the back right there. Woo! So is their pinch as hard as a blue crab? Pinch? No, it's not. It's more like a, um, it's much more like a pin prick versus a blue crab pinch. You feel it, especially the big ones. You'll feel it for sure. Um, but it's not, it's not as strong as a blue crab. And you can sort of see like this one's going to pinch harder. It's definitely got more muscle behind it. Um, but it's not as bad as a blue crab. So if you look at the claws of this one, look mm -hmm. at this size comparison and just think about that in terms of how much muscle is in there. And also, you know, how big the claws are as far as being able to um, grab something and pinch it. This crab right here is not likely to be able to pinch you much at all. And if it does, it it does barely it's not very it. strong for pinching. These are also, if you catch any of the baby ones, be gentle because it's very easy. Their, their carapace, their, their exoskeleton is not nearly as strong as the adults. And it's very easy to squish it. Um, it's much more delicate than, than when they get to be an adult and they have that super hard. I, I think he may be about to drop his legs because I do not have a good hold on him. Okay. Um, which is, no, that's fine. I, oh. just, <laughs> I was just making the comment. I was watching how he was moving. Um, 
So you mentioned like full size, but at what size are they adults? Because even like a blue crab um, with, a, with the females on the underside, um, when they're juveniles, it will be more triangle shaped. And when she reaches reproductive age, um, it will be more rounded out. I would almost, this one's almost there. Um, probably really, really close, if not already there and able to reproduce on that. But as far as an exact size. It is, it oh, has just oh. buried itself again. Yep. Very quickly. Very quickly. In case you missed it. Which side are you? Woo, I went to the front. <laughs> right there. Right there. So they're really good and will bury down so that just those two little black eyes are sticking up. So another thing that I think we could point out about ghost crabs um, and for a lot of people who have been to the beach and have, have an interest in looking, you know, when watching wildlife, um, if we sort of cast down the beach and look at the sandy beach and then look at the dune system, the beach is a pretty difficult environment for animals to live in. There's not a lot of shelter, not a lot of shade, um, they're exposed to the elements, to predators. So there are not that many animals that inhabit the beach. And ghost crabs are one of them. And so they're one of the animals that people interact with when they go to the beach. Um, but it's kind of interesting to note that they are inhabiting kind of a harsh environment. And there's not a whole lot of competition for this habitat. And so, you know, that is one of their important adaptations. The burrowing is a, an important adaptation for creating their own shelter from the harshness mm -hmm. of, the, of the environmental conditions and to hide from predators. Mm -hmm. And also being able to burrow down deep enough to get the moisture without having to expose themselves along the surface of the sand and going down to the water. That's mm -hmm. another important so very quickly, we might point out some of the sargasm that has been washing up on the beach. Um, it is a brown algae, algae that is uh, big enough to see as contrasted with microscopic algae. We call macroalgae and um, macroalgae that is in the ocean, we often call seaweed. So sargassum is a brown algae, a seaweed. And it has these little balls that are filled with air and it floats and sometimes it washes up on our beaches. And so this would be kind of a periodic addition to the beach habitat. Yep. That and food source. Live in. And food source. Not that's not the sargasm itself typically, but a lot of times the sargasm will have small organisms. So a little spider just fell out of this. <laughs> so it was using this as shelter. Um, so what kinds of things might they find in sargassum to eat? Um, fish, lots of tiny, um, I mean, lots of tiny little invertebrates like to inhabit the, the sargassum and all of these things, when it gets washed up, especially in a hurry, like right now with the high winds we have down on Dauphin Island, there's not necessarily an opportunity for dropping out of it before it gets washed up on the shore. And so those animals that are in there, the ghost crabs can come and work through the sargassum and actually find little tiny appetizer snacks inside. Right, so a lot of the animals will just kind of abandon the sargassum before it washes up on the beach, but sometimes if it's, if as it Carrie caught, mentioned, yeah. as, if it's washing up quickly, some of them might might not make that drop out of the sargassum before it washes up and then it provides food. So is there anything that you would kind of um, leave folks with as a broad message about ghost crabs or about um, yeah animals in this, uh, living in this ecosystem? Appreciate them, watch them. Whoo, we gotta get off the black sand. Hang on just a minute. It's hot. <laughs> it was hot. It's hot. <laughs> Super hot on our bare feet. Honestly, just next time you're at the beach, pay attention as you walk down. It's, it is fascinating if you really start to notice and look at the different, the different behaviors of these crabs and to just watch them sort of do their thing. Like it's very, very interesting to just sit and watch the watch the different behaviors and see how they have made this harsh habitat their own and it's really really special i'm 
I am a ghost crab lover for <laughs> sure. I, I like love, ghost crabs yeah, too. I love watching them. I think they're hilarious and fun, and um, just sort of appreciate them. And if you if you think about it, try not to just squish them <laughs> or cave in their burrows and stuff because they can. You can if you if they get entombed enough in their burrows, it is difficult for them to get out. Um, so just be mindful and observe and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. And thanks for joining us.